This is Florida Gulf Coast University. Dr. Jason Baker, he currently works at Mississippi State University, where uh, I worked there a while ago. Actually, Dr. Chestnut worked there, and uh, we're good friends. Got his undergraduate from New England Conservatory of Music, his doctorate from uh, University of North Texas, and he's still at, at Mississippi State. We're going to talk about uh, a piece that we worked on together while, uh, while we were both at Mississippi State. And oh, there's one of those cell phones, right? Um, and if you have a program, look at your program a minute. And this was a, a kind of a, a funny typo. Some of you will see that we're playing the four movements of this four movement piece. Some of you will see we're playing movements five through eight of an eight movement piece. Now that's just not true. It's really just a four movement piece. And I'll actually, I'll show you the first slide here. Um, this is how it ought to look, <laughs> all right? So um, I thought what we might do is just start off with um, Dr. Baker performing the piece, and then we'll talk about uh, how we collaborated, how it went together, the compositional process, uh, and all the sort of ideas behind it. And then we'll listen to it again at, at the end. So, ready? Take it away.
right. Yeah, not bad, huh? So this is what we're talking about today, how we put this uh, piece together. So let's, let's start about, you know, well, where, where did this start, right? And so uh, Jason had just uh, put together this uh, CD. No doubt you already all have this, right? This is uh, all solo snare drum music. Uh, and it's great. There's a, there's a lot of cool pieces on there, pieces that hadn't ever been recorded before. Um, we actually do have this CD in our library if you want to, to check it out. And, uh, you know, uh, Jason was really excited about the snare drum. said, you know, hey, why don't you write a piece for me for solo snare drum. And you can imagine, and I know some of my composition students are out there, the thrill and excitement of getting to write for the solo snare drum. Um, and so when Jason first came to me with this idea, you know, I, I first said, you know, I need to get to class. Sorry, you know, that I wasn't, wasn't terribly excited. So he, you know, and you know, a couple weeks later, he's like, you know, we can't take a hint. So he's like, you know, hey, how about this solo snare drum? Wouldn't that be a great thing to write? And you know, I have to grade these papers. Um, that's, you know, awesome. And so, you know, so I kind of avoided him and it's, it's kind of a small place at Mississippi. So he found me again and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm on my way to the gym. So maybe we can, uh, you know, I'll talk to you later. And uh, then, you know, finally he had me in my office and it was like, you know, you're going to write the snare drum piece for me. And I was like, hey, look over there. And I was able to make an escape. Um, but he was persistent, which is very good because not only is he a terrific player and a good friend, uh, it's an interesting uh, way of, of writing music. It's something I'd never written before, so it was a real challenge for me. So I really did start to think, you know, well, what about the snare drum? And first I thought about the limitations of writing for the snare drum. Uh, first in terms of timbre monochromatic, which was, uh, I actually had a little um, kind of preconceived notions. You know, I was thinking of just, you know, with the snares on and hitting it with the sticks and one kind of sound, right? One sort of color there. And then pitch, um, you know, we can't write, a, uh, you know, uh, all this kind of intricate counterpoint. I mean, you can have some rhythmic counterpoint with it, but we certainly can't have chord progressions like we learn in music theory or quintal chords or different levels of harmonic dissonance or, or melodic dissonance. Uh, and, you know, basically one line, you can hit the drum with your two hands and you can, you can sort of have some some polyphony there, but, uh, but really, you know, it's the snare drum. We can't, we can't get away from that, that fact. Now, um, once I started thinking about other possibilities, not just the limitations, uh, I began to uh, think more creatively about it and, and actually get somewhere. So you can use different things, different implements to, to hit the snare drum. We saw a lot of them here. A lot of these were demonstrated actually by Jason for me. So uh, snare sticks are, are sort of what we normally expect, but you can use mallets, right, uh, with different hardnesses. Uh, certainly brushes are something that's used, used a lot in jazz. Just use your hands. The Super Bowl, right, and this was the Super Bowl. Wasn't that terrifying, the Super Bowl? Um, there's different oh, places to hit, uh, you know, on the drum, uh, on the rim. Uh, doing different rim shots and dead strokes, and Jason might demonstrate these latest for us. Certainly snares on or off it has a, a different sound when you've got that. There's a wide dynamic range that we can use. Uh, this does have some very soft passages in it as well as loud passages. And of course, rhythm is, is the key thing with this. I mean, you can't get around the fact that this is, um, it's an instrument that's about rhythm. And it's, it's really good to, to have that as a, as a compositional focus. So, once I kind of made my list of different things that I could do, I did uh, meet with Dr. Baker and he demonstrated a lot of interesting things for me. And uh, then I started listening and studying repertoire. I know a lot of composers when they're working on a piece for a particular medium, you know, if they're working on a string quartet or a saxophone quartet, something, they really don't want to listen to anybody else's string quartet or saxophone quartet. They don't want to, um, be unduly influenced by those uh, other pieces. But for me, I really like to get in there and get all the sounds in my head and to know all the different possibilities. So um, Jason was kind enough to let me borrow some of the scores of the pieces that he had recorded. And so it, it really opened my eyes, opened my ears for a lot of um, different possibilities. So I started planning the piece out. And here are some of the first things that I decided on. I wanted to use multiple movements, right? And so it wound up being four movements. Uh, and I wanted to be relatively short, you know, maybe little character pieces. But having different movements uh, allows us to actually uh, change the implements or change the striking surface um, without sort of a, a dramatic pause that might interrupt the aesthetic flow. You know, if we have the end of a movement, we're kind of used to, as audience members or as performers, taking a little breath there and resetting for the next one. So I thought, if I have multiple movements, then I can get all these different sounds without sort of uh, disrupting the aesthetic. So I sat down to write it, 
and uh, I, I still didn't want to write it. Um, but I'd, I've, I'm out of excuses, right? So, so here's what I did, and this is kind of an interesting thing, and I think it worked out well. I thought, well, what would I rather write? If I weren't writing a snare drum piece, what would I, what would I work on instead? And uh, so I was like, you know, how would I approach another piece that's not for a snare drum? Well, uh, as many of you know, voice is my instrument. I, I'm a baritone, so I thought, well, maybe I'd write something for voice. And I'm really comfortable writing for voice, and I really enjoy it. I especially enjoy writing for choir, so maybe I would write a choir piece instead of the snare drum piece. Now, I would, didn't mention all this to Jason, but I was just like, you know, I want to keep composing, I want to be doing this, um, and maybe if I think about the things I would want to be writing, I can somehow apply it. And so if I were writing a, a choir piece, well, I'd have to pick a text, and I decided, well, I'd probably want to set a sacred text. And if you've uh, been with me in composition, you know that uh, if you're going to use a text, you want to use something that you can get the rights to, something in public domain. All right? And I, I thought, well, probably use a, a text in English. Since we speak English, I've set text in Latin or French. Uh, and so I thought, well, here's, maybe there's something in the Bible, the King James Version, which is in public domain. Um, and so I could look in there for something that involved percussion. Okay, so maybe that would kind of spur me on if I were heading towards writing a different piece, like a vocal piece. Um, maybe there's something there. And I did find this kind of a neat passage in Exodus. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. And so Aaron, of course, the brother of Moses, uh, and the piece that did wind up being called Song of Moses, took a, a timbrel uh, in her hand. And so basically we have a percussion ensemble right, that, that's happening here. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. You know, uh, I looked up other uh, parts in the Bible with different, uh, um, different uh, talking about percussion. But then, you know, as I was reading this, and I realized it was Exodus, and I realized Miriam and Aaron, they're, they're related to Moses. Uh, really, it was the moment of inspiration that I was waiting for. All right, and, and let me explain that a little bit. So, you know, as I mentioned, Jason and I are, are friends, but I, but I had this kind of synergy, you might say, of, of these ideas coming together. Um, we're both friends of, uh, fans of Charles Ives. Uh, Jason is from Connecticut originally. Uh, and we had, you know, just sort of when you're talking, it turns out we were both went to speech therapy when we were young. I couldn't say bathtub, and I'm very proud. I can say bathtub. I'll say it as many times as you'd like to hear it. Bathtub. <laughs> you can stop me in the hall. Where do you take a bath? In the bathtub, right? Um, so, um, but, it, but I realized that, you know, Moses had a speech impediment, right? I, I remember that from my Sunday school classes, and I found the spot where that was. Uh, and here's, here's sort of the relevant passage in the Bible. So, um, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And God says, don't worry, you can say bathtub or something like that. <laughs> uh, and so, but anyway, that, that made sense to me. And so then I, I decided, well, I would have this piece, uh, you know, Song of Moses. And here's how it would come together. Uh, I would set rhythmically the text of the, there's, a, there's a, a passage of the Bible that's referred to as the Song of Moses. And there, there it is. And so I would take the uh, words from that and, and set it just rhythmically for the snare drum. Now certainly there's, there's advantage to that. The voice is kind of limited in how fast it can play things, but I'm not limited rhythmically if I've got the snare drum. So this gives me uh, kind of a, a skeleton, something to, to hang my hat on to actually come up with the rhythms and not have to worry about um, being out in the abstract, kind of the ether there. Uh, I thought I would make this uh, a theme in variations, right? Uh, so that way I can have the multiple movements, right? So each, each variation kind of discrete. Uh, and the variations would represent different speech pathologies, right? So there's our, um, the, the slowness of, of tongue of Moses and then us going to speech therapy when, when we were children. Um, there's repetition when you repeat, 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 repeat something over and over, right? Um, prolongation, where you take a syllable and kind of get stretched out a little bit, or blah, king, where your voice kind of suddenly stops. And I thought, well, those things can really... Um, you know, I can take this, this theme, this idea, and actually apply those uh, in a musical way and, and have it uh, make sense. Finally, what I decided was maybe the theme should be at the end of the piece and present the variations before. And of course, uh, all of you know that uh, Dr. Thurmeyer are obsessed with uh, Charles Ives, as am I, as is Jason, as you should be someday, right? Um, and one of Ives' methods of, of using form in a piece he didn't really use sonata form so much. In sonata, we have a theme, a second theme. That theme gets de those themes get developed, and then they're presented again in their full at the end. Well, what Ives did was he, 
he would cut off that, the pre presentation of those first two themes and start with his development, right? And, and the pieces will culminate in the presentations of the themes. So what I decided was I'll have these, these variations first and then present the theme at the end, right? So that's a connection uh, with Jason and I and with uh, Charles Ives. So I decided to set up the piece in these four movements. So um, here's why I would use timbrely. Uh, it was important for me to actually have the classic snare drum sound with the snares on and with the sticks at the end, kind of save that at the end, because that's what everyone's going to be expecting, right? So let's, let's keep that at the end. Uh, the, the movements, they kind of get more, um, from more abstract to more concrete in terms of what we expect from our snare drum. So the snares are off, right, which is a sound that we're not always used to. Yarn mallets um, sticks on the rim only, not on the head of the drum, and the use of hands, all right? So we can do those uh, sorts of um, techniques. Prolongation has the snares on, but with brushes and a super ball mallet rather than the snare sticks themselves. Uh, blocking, the snares are off. We're getting closer to the actual sound of the snare drum that we're used to. Um, snares off, snare sticks, and uh, the use of a, a dead stroke, which is just kind of hitting it, hitting uh, the drum head and not letting the, the stick bounce off. And then finally, uh, the snares on with the snare sticks uh, and, and the use of hitting on the, on the rim as well. So there's kind of a progression of timbres through the four movements. Then uh, how is it going to be arranged thematically? Uh, well, certainly, first thing I did was I, I wrote the fourth movement, which is the setting of the Song of Moses, uh, rhythmically. And then I went back and, and I kind of picked some motives out of this and uh, had them repeated a bunch of times. You know, and actually, I thought it worked pretty well. It has a palindromic design. Uh, prolongation, I just took the first 10 measures of this and really kind of distorted it, just pulled it all out of whack. Um, the blocking, uh, I used just kind of uh, cut from, from this some of the more interesting parts, I thought, and then have them cut, suddenly uh, uh, you know, cut off, have them stop. Uh, and then I added a, a little uh, ending bit to it as well. Now, the piece when I first had it was called Stutterin' and Stammerin', right? And, and Jason, uh, it, and it even says that on your score here today. And I, I, after he learned it and played it for me, I actually told him about all this that went into it. And he was like, you can't call it stutter and stammering. I mean, that's such a great idea for a piece. So we changed the name. That was one of the first things we did. Um, and we just edited some of the notation and that sort of thing. And this uncertainty slash responsibility, you know, whenever you play a piece um, or whenever you write a piece, you're always in a collaboration with somebody, right? So if you're playing a Beethoven sonata, you're collaborating with Beethoven, you're making music together with Beethoven. And of course the audience is there to receive that. Um, but never had I written a piece where I was like, it's finished, I, you know, I hope it's good, I don't even know. Um, I really, it, w it was really, you know, quite terrifying for me to write. It's like composing in a straight jacket. And uh, so then it was like, boy, I hope Jason can make this good because I did what I could. So it, I've never been in a position where I was like so reliant, I think, on a, on a performer to really make the most of it. And, uh, and I think Jason has, and uh, he's, he's performed it several times, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's turned out well. Uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that this year it was accepted for publication by Drop6, um, which is a, a, a publishing company. They, they do a lot of percussion publishing. Jason actually has some uh, pieces that are um, published by them. Uh, and I think what we do now is we're going to maybe perform the piece again, or you're going to perform the piece again, uh, and then we'll uh, maybe we'll have some some questions. So let's uh, here that's us, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do this time, and hopefully you you can see this. I have a PDF of the score, and as as Jason plays, I'm going to scroll through it. You might look at some of the notation that we use for this. Uh, and uh, are you ready? Here, let me get out of this and, and call up the score. And uh, after this, we'll entertain some questions, that sort of thing. Oh, and while I still have your attention, please know that Jason is doing a solo percussion recital tonight, right, in this hall at 7.30. Uh, this piece will be on there as well, a couple other pieces by me, and one piece by you, or two pieces by you? One piece by you, and some other things. He's going to be playing vibraphone, uh, marimba, and snare drum. So, you ready? All right, let's have it.
So we have a few minutes left, and I hope some of you have some questions, or I don't know any jokes. Um, actually, I know some jokes, but I'm not going to tell them. Yeah? How did you decide where to put the lyrics in the uh, Okay, so um, once I told Jason that the final movement was uh, you know, a setting of this text, uh, he, he said, and do you, have, you don't have it in there, do you? Uh, Jason said you should put the, the text in there so that, that the players know what, what they're, they're doing. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the motives are, are related to the text. I didn't go into that in, in great detail. But of course, the uh, text, if you're going to sing it, is normally going to go below the line, right? And then our dynamics, if we're singers, you know, they, they go above. Here, the text is, is above where the rhythm is happening because normally you're going to be looking for the dynamics below the line. Right. So, so that was one of Jason's suggestions, but I think it's good. And it's actually published with the lyrics in there. Did you want to and say? I might add, too, um, knowing where, or knowing what the lyrics were that I was uh, lyrics, before, yeah, yeah. Uh, playing, um, that, that really helped inform some of how I performed it, like even taking some liberties. Um, for example, in that last movement where I get that grace note, and then the, the main note in percussion, what we call a flam, that's always on the word, the Lord. So I'd open that up a little bit. The Lord. You know, I, I didn't want it to just go by too quick, like a quick grace note. And also the last bar, I, there's a, a, a three grace notes going into the final note, and that is Alleluia. And so I, I opened that up more to sound more like a rhythm, you know, as, as opposed to just how, how it would be perhaps traditionally played in percussion, having that be very tight. So, And that's... That's a couple of instances where, where I didn't really perform it maybe exactly if I had said it to a metronome or something. It, it allowed me to, to take some, some informed choices there. Yeah, and actually, while you bring up the, the, you know, we would say, Alleluia, but I just liked, on the snare drum, I liked the Alleluia at the end. So that's, I took a little liberty with the t text. We're all, we're very liberty inclined up here, I guess. So, what else do you guys want to know about the snare drum piece? Yeah. Uh, about the um, about the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Like what made um, what what influence what influenced you to uh, use that? Well, it was in the prolongation movement, right? Where something gets kind of. Uh, and can you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can explain it. yeah. Please go ahead. Just to kind of back up a little bit with the Super Bowl, um, and this is something that's not uncommon to percussion playing. Quite often, you see a normal sized Super Bowl, and then you put a stick into it. And it can be used on snare drum, it can be used on a bass drum, on a gong, um, on, on a cymbal. It's actually, for percussionists out there, it's a really, really easy way to make a lion's roar uh, sound on, on bass drum. But there was another piece that I did where I, was, where I actually had the full super ball in and then the stick in there. And, and obviously, as it gets dried out and kind of brittle, um, one time actually before a performance, it actually broke in half. So I just kind of took this and stuck it in there, and come to find out, it actually works much better. I get great, I, I get much more leverage, so I can sort of press down and get some different sounds, and not really having to worry about it bounce around. Um, to speak to it from a compositional angle, and, and Jason had mentioned all of these movements were based on different types of uh, speech uh, in, impediments or speech pathologies, and. Jason had mentioned that, uh, that we had both been in speech therapy as children. I'll, I'll go further to say that I'm, I'm actually an adult stutterer myself. Um, and so those are things that I, I deal with pretty much on a daily basis as somebody who teaches at a uh, university, you know, and at times having to teach that 300 person music appreciation class, you know. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So, uh, um, so it, it, it was a very personal piece to me, and the, the Super Bowl really I find is, is probably the closest sound to what that physiologically feels like when you get caught in one of those prolongation moments as a stutterer. And to even go further from that topic too, I, I like how the variation in theme form, sort of the Ivesian form was used where the, the final movement sort of seems as an overcoming or coming to terms with that uh, the uh, speech impediment. And uh, so taking each movement to sort of work through it. And then the final movement, how I try to play it, I try to play the first three movements with an awful lot of tension. And I try to, just in the way I interpret it, my, my grace notes, rolls, very uh, edgy sounding, very, uh, very tight to sort of, 
I feel like if I can achieve the same physiological tension in my hands, which in most plane situations we try to avoid, but if I can achieve that here so it feels like what it goes on you know, when I'm in a stuttering moment, um, that can best communicate that. And then when I get to the fourth movement, for those percussionists out there, you, you might have noticed that my drags, the grace notes, were a lot more open, a lot more relaxed, the tempo, there was more time, there was a little more space in there. And that was sort of how when you're speaking fluently, which for the majority of you in this room, I'm sure you're, you're naturally fluent speakers, that's how it feels when you normally speak. So I, I guess as a way of, uh, of combining sort of two aspects of my life, um, things that have been with me for a very long time, being a percussionist, but also being a stutterer too. It's, it's an interesting form of therapy. And each time I get to get up on stage with Dr. Barr here, it's, it's a... It's a good experience to kind of work through that again. So, yeah. any, any other questions? We could maybe one quick more. Okay, yeah, Mr. Jones. Just actually to piggyback on, on what uh, Greg was mentioning, who, what was it, performer Jason or composer Jason, <laughs> yeah. who actually decided the type of it outside of obviously the motivation of what you're trying to achieve with each uh-huh. Uh, did you come up with the ideas, of, or were you collaborative on that? Well, from from how I remember, I, yeah. did, did the rhythms just come from you speaking the text and just the natural text rhythms? Mm -hmm. Whoever did that translation of that that passage, in yeah. Exodus, I think it was very much like it was kind of handed down from above. Yeah, and so and yeah, and what I did. What I, you know, normally when I compose, I sit at the, the piano and I kind of work things out. I maybe I'll put a few things in finale and kind of go back and forth. This, I was just on my couch with staff paper and a metronome, you know, and I was saying the words out loud and, and marking things and, and seeing where I wanted to have downbeats and what motives might fit with different things. And then from there, the other three movements kind of got abstracted from it. And we, adjust a few, we adjusted a few things uh, just for practical reasons, especially in the first three movements, which have all the different uh, changes of implements and things like that. But the final movement, we didn't change too many things, I don't think. No, I think from, from the, uh, I, I think as, as you probably would have noticed from looking at, at the score, the complexity of, of the rhythms there, I think pr that, that probably came about just because you were very, being very honest with really trying to meter out what you were saying. Mm -hmm. I think if, if we had rounded things off, or if you had rounded things off, you'd probably get rhythms that were a little bit more symmetrical. So yeah. I would think, and then the first three movements are sort of, I guess, trying to say passage of, passages of it, but mm -hmm. the speaking, the rhythms get interrupted by various forms of speech disfluency. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, it's uh, uh, it, w it was a very interesting way of, of writing and, and something I, I hadn't done before, but I'm pleased with it. Yeah, I don't turn that Thanks again for being here.